Today, we're going to be moving on to cell respiration, which is chapter 9 on Campbell Biology and is part of Unit 3 in the AP Biology curriculum. So let's begin. Hi everyone, my name is Mikey from Able Prep Academy, and we're finally moving on to cell respiration, which is part of chapter nine. More specifically, we're gonna be talking about aerobic cell respiration, which is the use of oxygen in order to break down that glucose molecule into carbon dioxide, releasing the energy required to charge up those ATPs that our cells need to survive. Now, in order to provide a more comprehensive understanding of this unit, I really wanted to divide this video into five parts. The first part, which is the most important, because in the first part of this video, I really wanna emphasize how we think of glucose as a highly energetic molecule with great amount of chemical potential energy. Because I do believe that if we can figure that out, if we can really lay down the groundwork for what we think about glucose and what we're really trying to get out of that glucose molecule, it will make the rest of the cell respiration process much easier to understand. The second, third, fourth, and the fifth parts are going to deal with glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, the Krebs cycle, as well as oxidative phosphorylation. I'm not gonna talk about fermentation or anaerobic respiration today. That's probably gonna be another video, so we can save that topic for the next time. But without further ado, let's begin talking about glucose and specifically looking at why we think of glucose as a highly energetic molecule. So if you remember back when we talked about chapter eight and the idea of complexity and simplicity, what you might recall is that we can think of glucose as a relatively complex molecule, and that is where perhaps the energy of glucose might lie. Because if you remember what happens when complex things become simpler, entropy in the system increases, which is then related to the idea of catabolic pathways, which is then related to the ideas of exergonic reactions, we can kind of say that when complex things become simpler, we release energy. And that's maybe the energy that we use to make ATP, and that would be correct. But the idea of complexity is a little bit vague. So what we can do here is to investigate one step further and talk about what makes that complexity? Because if we take that additional step, then we can say that what creates complexity in the glucose molecule are the covalent bonds that are holding that glucose molecules together. Because the more bonds you have, the more atoms are connected together, creating that complexity, reducing the entropy of that molecule. However, we could do one better, because if I take that last additional step and say, look, these covalent bonds are made from the sharing of electrons, because then we can say that the energy of glucose is perhaps held within those highly energetic electrons that are holding glucose together. And if you think about the word oxidation, when we say we're going to oxidize glucose into carbon dioxide, that term refers to the removal of electrons. And what we do here during the breakdown of glucose is by breaking down those covalent bonds, what we're able to do is remove move those electrons out and hopefully use these highly energetic electrons to leverage some way to create a lot of ATPs within the mitochondria. Okay, so what that means is that you want to really think about the entire cell respiratory process as a process of removing electrons from glucose so that those electrons can get to work and make us all those ATPs that the cells create. As I mentioned before, the parts two, three, four, and five are gonna deal with glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. Now, I know that I divided those processes into four different parts, although the book treats them as three different parts because they say that the three parts of cell respiration is glycolysis, and then they group together pyruvate oxidation and the Krebs cycle, and then of course, oxidative phosphorylation as the last step. But I do think that pyruvate oxidation is pretty important, so I'm gonna separate them. But before we get to that, of course, we need to talk about glycolysis. Now, there is a relatively complex diagram that displays all of the different steps that are involved in the glycolytic pathway. However, for the purpose of the AP exam, it's not necessary that you remember all of the enzymes and all of the chemical substrates that are part of that long pathway. So what we're gonna do for this video is to just focus on the simplified version of glycolysis. So the term glycolysis really refers to the breakdown of glucose or the cutting of glucose into two equal molecules that we call pyruvate or pyruvic acid. Now, in order to perform glycolysis, there is an investment phase where the cell does need to spend two ATPs to get the ball rolling, so to say. But then during the payoff phase, we get four ATPs back, meaning that you have a net gain of two ATPs. And you know what? That's fantastic because ATPs are what we're really looking for at the end of the day here. So we can kind of set those ATPs aside. However, there is one more thing that's happening, which is super important. As glycolysis takes place, 
The bonds that hold together a six carbon sugar are broken in order to create two three carbon substances. And if you think about a circle and you wanna create two chords, you'll notice that you'll have to cut that circle at two places. And that means that we're gonna be breaking down two covalent bonds in order to get our two pyruvates. So two covalent bonds being broken means that potentially four highly energetic electrons are gonna be released. And this is where we introduce the molecule nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, also known as NAD+. And NAD plus is an electron carrier. What that means is that it works kind of like a truck with a flatbed where when the electrons are released from glycolytic processes, then we can take those electrons and put them on the bed, therefore turning NAD plus into what we call NADH. The H you can kind of think of as a tarp that goes over the flatbed, allowing the secure positioning of the materials that you're carrying, or in this case, electrons. So when NAD plus and H plus come together alongside two electrons, then we get an NADH molecule, which means that if we have four electrons that we're freeing up, then we're gonna be charging up two NADH molecules as a result of glycolysis. But our job's not quite done yet because two pyruvate molecules still contain six carbons and we haven't turned any of those into carbon dioxide. So we still have yet a lot more energy to release, and this is where we start to involve the mitochondria. By the way, glycolysis, of course, occurs in the cytoplasm. There's a video that discusses the importance of that idea in the description below if you haven't checked that out already. But let's talk about pyruvate oxidation. Pyruvate oxidation is the process of importing pyruvate from the cytoplasm into the mitochondrial matrix. And there's some really important things that happen here. If you look at a diagram of pyruvate, the grayed out part, which is carbon dioxide, oxide does get released as that pyruvate moves from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria. But remember, as that covalent bond is broken, we have two electrons that are freed up and we charge up another NADH here. Now here's the part that gets a little bit confusing. The two carbons that are remaining after the CO2 is released from pyruvate are sort of unstable. I kind of like to use the analogy of a bald man wearing a wig, nothing against bald men, you should see the back of my head. But the point is that once the wig falls off, the bald man grabs a cap really quickly and puts it on his head. And that cap is the coenzyme A, because as soon as the carbon dioxide falls off, electrons are captured by NAD plus into NADH, coenzyme A attaches to the two carbon substrate becoming what we call acetyl-CoA. And that is all there is to pyruvate oxidation. One tricky thing here to think about though, is that if you're doing any accounting at all, counting the numbers of NADH and ATP being produced, you have to remember that there are two pyruvates being produced per glucose. So even though I walked you guys through one pyruvate going into the mitochondria producing one NADH, if we were to do this calculation per glucose, then you'd have to say, well, there are two NADHs that are gonna be produced because there are two pyruvates that form from a single glucose going once and twice into the mitochondria. But let's not do that. Let's actually just focus on one pyruvate forming one acetyl-CoA for the simplicity's sake. Now that we have acetyl-CoA, this is when we introduce the Krebs cycle, also known as a citric acid cycle. Now, this is one of the more confusing parts of cell respiration, but as I mentioned, if you focus on the idea of ripping out electrons from glucose as the name of the game, then it actually makes a little bit more sense, although there are some confusing parts as well. But let's begin by taking that acetyl-CoA. As acetyl-CoA drops off the two original carbon substrates attached to the coenzyme A, it drops it off into that citric acid cycle, allowing that two carbon substrate to engage with oxaloacetate, which is a four carbon acid. Now the new six carbon acid that forms as a result of four plus two is going to be called citrate or citric acid from which we also get the name citric acid cycle. Now there is something boring that happens here. There's an isomerase that turns citrate into isocitrate, but nothing interesting is happening here. We're just setting up for the next big events that are to occur because the next thing that occurs is that that CO2 that we see on the right side of isocitrate is gonna be removed. And again, if we're breaking bonds, we're releasing electrons and voila, there's NAD plus ready to capture those electrons again. And as alpha ketoglutarate forms, we yet have more carbon dioxide to throw out. So that's what happens next. Next. The carbon dioxide at the bottom of alpha ketoglutarate is next. It gets removed, and once again, two electrons are released, which means that NAD plus can be charged up to NADH yet again. But at this point, coenzyme A makes a reappearance, turning this substrate into what we call succinyl CoA. Now, succinyl CoA, as you can see, is now four carbons long, which means that the initial two carbons that we brought in from the acetyl CoA have now fully been oxidized into CO2, allowing us to imagine that by this point, any type of carbon that we began with in glucose molecule would have all been converted into carbon dioxide. 
but there is a little bit more to do here because when you squeeze juice from a fruit, you know, there's always that little bit more. And that is exactly what the Krebs cycle is going to do. It's going to squeeze out the very last bit of energy that's remaining here. And what happens between Saxno Koe and Saxne is that you have this conveyor effect of GDP becoming GTP and GTP returning back to GDP, but phosphorylating ADP into ATP in return. The whole process looks confusing, but the most important thing to note here is that this is what we call substrate level phosphorylation. We have an enzyme that's facilitating the phosphorylation of ATP during the conversion of succinyl-CoA to succinate. And then from succinate, we form fumarate. But here we yet have another electron carrier that we introduce, and that is called FAD. Now, FAD is just a different type of truck also performing the same function. So if we were to take that truck analogy a little bit further, then NAD plus is like a Ford F-150 and FAD is like a Chevy Colorado, okay? I don't know whether those cars are equal, but but they're both trucks and they're both performing generally the same thing. And what you get at the end of this is something called fumarate. Now, you'll notice that fumarate actually has a double bond, which is why we're able to release these electrons because going from single bonds to double bonds, you actually are able to create more efficient molecules releasing electrons in between. Now, you relieve of those double bonds with water forming what we call malate, which then once again is able to charge up another NAD+, forming what we call oxaloacetate, but that's what we began with. So the whole circle is complete. But by the end of this circle, what we should have are three NADH, one FADH2, as well as one ATP. Now on the basis of counting per glucose, then that would be six NADH, two FAD and two ATP. Now up to this point, as I mentioned, we've now oxidized the entirety of the glucose molecule, but we've only really produced four ATPs. And that's a bit of a head scratcher because this whole process is supposed to produce somewhere between 30 to 32 ATP, but we only have produced four. So where are the remaining 26 to 28? Well, it turns out that those highly energetic electrons that we've been collecting on the back of our trucks, well, how many do we have? Well, we have 10 NADH, we have two FADH2. Well, those electrons are now gonna get to work in performing what we call oxidative phosphorylation, which is the last part of this video. Now, I think it's worthwhile to mention that the citric acid cycle just occurred in the matrix of the mitochondria, whereas oxidative phosphorylation is gonna occur on the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. Now, remember the inner membrane here is gonna be a phospholipid bilayer, and we're going to have a lot of proteins that are embedded within it. Now, I'm just gonna introduce you to the proteins that you just need to know for this oxidative phosphorylation, so it goes like this. Protein complex one, protein complex two, ubiquinone, protein complex three, cytochrome complex, protein complex four, and ATP synthase. So let's talk about why these are really important. Now, do remember that between the inner membrane and the outer membrane, we have something called the intermembrane space, and that is gonna serve a really important role. Now, here's the idea. NADH and FADH2 are carrying highly energetic electrons. These electrons can do work. And when I say work, I don't mean just generally work. I'm talking about very specific work, like transport work. Do you remember talking about active transport in unit two? Remember that active transport is the action of moving materials from an area of low concentration to an area of higher concentration utilizing energy. Now that energy was typically ATP, but it doesn't have to be. It could be these highly energetic electrons too. So here is what happens. NADH is able to take those highly energetic electrons and drop them off at protein complex one. Now, FADH2 can do the same thing, dropping off those highly energetic electrons at protein complex two. Now, within protein complex one, however, the electron's energy can be slowly drawn out, and using proteins, we're able to pump protons, or H plus ions, from the matrix of the mitochondria into the intermembrane space. And this is an active transport mechanism. Now, after that, these electrons are gonna converge at Q or ubiquinone, aptly named because ubiquitous means everything. And here, we're looking at a protein that can accept electrons not only from NADH or FADH2, but from everything. And at Q, it's able to pass it on to protein complex three, where, again, protons are pumped into the intermembrane space. And passing through cytochrome C, we get these electrons to protein complex four, where yet again, more protons are pumped. Now, what you should imagine right now is that these electrons are slowly losing an energy, which is being utilized to pump protons into the intermembrane space. Let's talk about that first, because remember that in the intermembrane space, we're going to have a high proton concentration, whereas the matrix is gonna have a relatively low concentration of protons. And what they're gonna wanna do is to come back in. And as they come back in through the ATP, synthase, 
they're able to then utilize the rotor within the ATP synthase protein to physically and chemically alter ADP and phosphate and turn it into adenosine triphosphate or ATP. So then from those 10 NADH and 2 FADH2, all the electrons pumping those protons will ultimately result in somewhere between 26 to 28 ATPs that are being produced through this process called the oxidative phosphorylation. Now I should also mention that everything from protein complex one to protein complex four are called the electron transport chain because as the name suggests, they're literally transporting electrons and utilizing their energy to pump those protons into the intermembrane space. And this is where knowledge from unit two, understanding diffusion, concentration gradients and active transport, and of course, how the semi-permeable membrane can block out charged substances is gonna be really helpful. So if you don't really get what's happening in this last part, I would highly suggest you revisit unit two and check out cell membranes or chapter seven in the Campbell Biology textbook for a better foundation. Now there's one last thing that we have to talk about because remember that these electrons are going in a linear way. They're being dropped off at protein complex one or two and they're going through the protein complexes and ultimately they're ending up at protein complex four. But much like a cup that cannot be filled with additional water past its brim, we have to remove these electrons so that new electrons can come in at the beginning at protein complex one and two. And the removal of these electrons is where oxygen comes into play, which is why this is called oxidative phosphorylation. You see, in biology, when we talk about cell respiration, we refer to oxygen as the final electron acceptor, because at the very end of this entire ETC, oxygen is able to take those electrons and combining with two H plus ions, it's able to actually create a water molecule. And that is where 6O2 becoming 6H2O comes into play. Now remember that these electrons by the end of protein complex four have very low energy. So even though they form H2O, these electrons are lower in energy, therefore not giving water any substantial energy. Hence, a bottle of water has zero calories. And I hope that makes sense to you guys as to what that energy was used for within this entire process. So guys, that about sums up aerobic cell respiration in a nutshell. Like I said, there are more details to be found in the textbook about glycolysis with the specific reactions that are happening, which can be useful for college level courses, as well as anaerobic cell respiration. But we're gonna do a lecture on anaerobic cell respiration, specifically on why oxygen is so important and how that can impact the entire cell respiration process and how fermentation can actually help to mitigate that issue to a certain degree anyway. But that's it for today. And if this content has been helpful to you, click the like button, perhaps subscribe to our channel, click the bell icon so that you can stay up to date on unit four, unit five, and unit six, and hopefully all the way to unit eight within this year. This has been Mikey with Able Prep Academy. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.